Um, so uh, let me give a quick introduction uh, of Mark. If you don't know him, uh, you have other things you should be uh, researching before you come here. But I will do the introduction, so everybody, for the folks who don't know. Co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, can I say the most prominent firm in, uh, in Silicon Valley, or is that too much? OK, the most prominent firm in Silicon Valley. Um, known for his humbleness. And uh, <laughs> um, co-created the highly influential Mosaic internet browser. Basically, if you use a web browser, Mark was directly uh, uh, you know, part of that, part of our, our uh, Silicon Valley history. Co-founded Netscape, which sold to AOL for $4.2 billion. Then you co-founded LoudCloud, which uh, sold to HP for 1.6 billion, and you served on the HP board from 2008 to 2018, and uh, and you serve on the Applied Intuition board. So, uh, round of applause for Mark. So uh, today's uh, conversation, we have about an hour. Uh, we're going to cover three major areas. Uh, first is just the technology markets today. That's kind of a, a, a real area of your expertise, and we'd love to hear your perspectives there. Everything from kind of the, the you know the tech tech industry today and generative AI. Then we'll talk about defense. Uh, that's really what the audience r really cares about: national security. And then we'll wrap it up with some questions about starting companies and entrepreneurship, and we're going to learn from that. So uh, at the uh, you know you're a big fan of uh, history, and you're a big student of history. Um, there is a little bit of an impulsive fear right now uh, of new technologies. And um, is that a recent phenomena? Is that a, and, and how have you seen that kind of uh, evolve over your career? Yeah, so this, this is a hot topic right now, right, because of the AI, the sudden AI panic. And there was you know, hearings on the Hill yesterday um, uh, with, uh, you know, the end of the world. End of the, the end of the world is here again. Um, and this time it's AI uh, that's going to get us. So. Um, uh, it's like a Marvel comic. It just keeps coming. It is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's yeah, year 60 of Marvel comics, and Magneto is still about to destroy everything. So, um, yeah, so, uh, it, yeah, it's this thing. And, you know, if you, you, memory on these things is always really fuzzy, you know, in terms of, you, so there's an old Douglas, Adam, old Douglas Adams who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and he said this is always a generational thing. He said if you're between the age of uh, 15 to 25, whatever is the new technology is just like what's normal. Um, uh, if you're between the age of 25 and I think you said 40, uh, the new technology is exciting. You can probably make a career in it. Um, if you're age 40 or above, the new technology is absolutely horrifying and evil. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And it's going to destroy society as we know it. Um, We're both in the 25. Uh, I, am well <laughs> above, I am well above the, uh, the, uh, the, the, that third cutoff. Um, and so it, it, there is this human nature thing. Um, for people who haven't seen it, there's a website uh, and Twitter account called Pessimists Archive. Is this guy who basically documents this, and so you, you you basically can go back in time and you can say, well, what did people say at the introduction of like the bicycle? Uh, and by the way, it turned out that people were horrified. Like the the, the, the bicycle, <laughs> the bicycle story is actually really funny. So the the bicycle story was in the, like 1860s when when consumer bicycles uh, kind of hit. Is it, and by the bicycles, I'm just talking about like you get on the bike and like ride the pedals. Like there's no you know no there motorized no motorized anything. You know no AI in the bicycle in 1860. Um, and uh, the media coverage at the time was that, uh, th so the significance of the bicycle at that time was it was the first time that people could easily travel, right, faster than, faster than on foot um, and, and even faster than on horse, um, and especially young people. And young people in rural environments could go from, from town to town, which means they could <coughs> date uh, across, across, uh, across uh, between towns. And so this, this started a moral panic about uh, the devolution of, of society. And so the, the magazines at the time promoted an idea called Bicycle Face. Um, and so they told young women, specifically at that time, they said, if you ride the bicycle, the exertion from riding the bicycle uh, will cause your face to scrunch up. Um, and then if you ride the bicycle for too long, your face will freeze in position. Uh, and you will never be able to get married. Um, and the moral of the story was, stay in your village, right? Do not, do not, do not venture out. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, you know, there was, it was, there was a moral panic around the calculator, right? It was going to, like, destroy math classes. There was a moral panic around the, with the Walkman. Everybody was going to be walking around. Everybody's going to get killed in the street because they had headphones on. So anyway, it, there's this long, and then internet, like, is just, like, endless, endless crime and terrorism and on and on. Now, and now, you know, it's now hate speech misinformation, just, like, endless litany of all these, of all these, of all these kind of boogeyman crises. Um, and so I, a while back, I just got frustrated enough. I was like, okay, what's going on? Like, why, why is this happening? And so I, I, I tried to dig into the psychology of it. And what I finally came to was, it turns out, um, in the sort of, in sort of neurochemistry, uh, sort of brain, brain uh, structure, um, there, there, it turns out there's, there's a circuit for uh, fear. 
uh, and it's the fight or flight circuit, and it's the, it's the amygdala um, in the limbic system, um, uh, and that's well known and understood. And then there's something called the exploratory circuit, which is the dopamine circuit, um, and that's the circuit that causes us to like, you know, put our head up and try to, try to go, go figure out new things. Um, but there's no optimism circuit, right? Like there, there's no like positivity circuit. There's no there's no circuit that says, "Wow, the new thing might be just like exciting and fantastic." And, and I think it's not that an evolutionary imperative. It's not an evolutionary imperative because evolutionary imperative. If you think about evolutionary imperative, think back to like you know whatever we're hunter gatherers or whatever on the on the, on the plains, um, and it's like, what do we need to know? We need to know that like most things coming at us are like really scary because they might eat us, they might kill us and eat us. Um, but we do need to know we need to venture out at least a little bit because we might you know we need to be able to like find more food and we might find you know find a better place to. to to move the camp to, and so the, those are like the so so basically it's like we poke our head up, we're a little bit curious, and then it's like ah, right, and then we like go running back to the camp, and and we just and, and that circuit is that that basic circuit is still firing, and so the the rarest thing in the world is any sort of you know what I would argue you know realistic or even optimistic you know story of the prospect of the positive prospects of a new technology or a new trend, like almost nobody ever tells that story. Why do you think in I feel like that that's generally true in most of the world, but in the Bay Area it's a little bit flipped. Where if you're not working on new things, it's you're actually you know it's funny uh, if you're in D.C. and somebody works at a, a Google or Facebook, people are like, oh wow. If you're in the Bay Area and somebody works at Google or Facebook, people are like, oh, what happened? You know, what's wrong? <laughs> like, does your family have a health problem? Are you still there until that? And then you're going to get out. <laughs> so uh, why do you think, you know, as we talk about this, you know, uh, uh, discussion between D.C. and the Valley, what what happened? It's the same country. It's generally the same people. Where did you used to work? What? Yeah, I used to work in Detroit. Yeah, and before I used to work at Google, Google so I can Google, make fun of Google, 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 Google because okay, you know okay, I, you know, I'm okay, an good, alumni. Good, good. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So look, it, it's, it's, I also say, look, what the dynamic I just described also applies within Silicon Valley, right? And so, like a lot of this AI doom kind of mongering that's happening right now is yeah. actually happening from inside the valley. There's actually a very funny exchange in the Cold War. There's this big movie on uh, Robert Oppenheimer that's going to come out this summer from Christopher Nolan, and it's going to be, you know, just it's going to be. I'm sure it's just going to be extraordinary. It's going to be fantastic, but. You know, um, uh, Oppenheimer became famous in his later, you know, he, he led the development of the atomic bomb, and then in his later years he became kind of famous for essentially being an activist against the, the use of, of, of nuclear um, power, and, you know, kind of went on and on about how guilty he felt and how terrible everything was and, and so forth. And, and uh, John von Neumann, right, his contemporary, who's the co-inventor of the, of the computer and a, another legendary physicist at that time, it's some, I'll mangle the quote, but it was something along the lines of, um, you know, some people confess guilt uh, about something they've done in order to take credit for it, <laughs> right? And so or the, the collo colloquial term is the humble brag, yeah. right? Um, and so even within our industry, there's a fair amount of, um, you saw it on the Hill yesterday, it's a fair amount of like, oh, this new thing that I have spent the last 40 years of my life inventing <laughs> is really terrible. <laughs> did I mention that I invented it, right? <laughs> Boy, it's really powerful. Did I mention that? Um, <laughs> I, I am really important. Um, and so, uh, you know, we even have that going on. But, but yeah, so look, and then, and then you get into the relationship, right, the relationship between Silicon Valley and, and, and D.C. And, you know, look, the relationship between Silicon Valley and D.C., like, I would say overall the, the, the trend is not, not very good. Um, and, and, the, and I think the reason for that is, you know, there, there was a time... And this, you know, this goes back to the atomic age, but in the computer, original computer age. But there was a time when there was a very tight level of coordination and cooperation between between DC and kind of the military industrial complex and intelligence agencies and so forth, and, and then and then Silicon Valley. And in fact, in the history of Silicon Valley, a lot of Silicon Valley is the result of, of government funding, and in particular, funding associated with defense and intelligence. And of course, DARPA played a big role there, and a lot of other federal I mean, agencies. In self driving. What's that? In self driving. Yeah. Also, right. So uh, DARPA seeded self driving. Right. That entire the uh, entire autonomy revolution. So so so. But you know, there was this very tight relationship, uh, you know, if you actually going all the way back to like the 1920s actually in Northern California, but then certainly through, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, like I started in the 90s, my company Netscape started in the 90s, and it, the relationship was not what it had been 30 years earlier, but it was still quite strong, and it, we actually had a big, a big federal systems business in the, in the 90s. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, I think the, the, the world has been changing, you know, politics, politics have kind of always been polarized, but there's something about the current polarization that I think has caused I don't know, maybe a separation between the coasts. Um, I said people out in California probably feel more alienated uh, from, you know, kind of the, the, the country in some ways, the federal government in some ways, than, than they did before. Uh, and you know, and that, and that peaked in the in that is in that case of Google, you know, where Google uh, Project Maven, yeah. uh, you know, got killed you know, by internal activism at Google, and, and that's the kind of thing that would have never happened, you know, 30 years earlier, but it, it did happen. 
in the, in the 2010s. Um, now, look, the other side of it is, and, and so I say Silicon Valley, I think, bears a lot of responsibility for kind of disconnecting itself from, from actually the very important mission of, of especially the defense and intelligence uh, complex out here. Um, look, at the same time, it is also the case that the technology that is being developed in Silicon Valley is moving at a high rate of speed. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, coming up here. But, um, you know, it is really, really important that people in D.C. who are in decision-making, you know, capacity, really important that they really wrap their heads around what's going on. And it, it, if it's all happening 3,000 miles away, <laughs> right, it's almost as if it's happening in another country or in another continent. How do you, uh, but just culturally, maybe uh, whether it's in D.C. or the Valley, uh, t you know, change that fear to optimism, um, especially around, you know, this generative AI uh, kind of boom that's happening? Or yeah. is that something we shouldn't even really think about and, and we let the chips fall where they may? Yeah, so the, maybe the good, maybe the optimistic view, the, the, maybe the way to get to optimism would be basically a lot of these new technologies now are actually very easy for individuals to use. And yeah. so, right, technology used to always be kind of a big company government domain and then 30 years later you get the consumer version, like in the case of the computer. But now, like, look, the stuff, the leading edge technology now actually rolls out to consumers first. And so the, maybe the, the other side of this would be that, that you, it's just this stuff is really easy to get to. And in fact, the other running joke about the hearings, the AI hearings yesterday is they were also a tech support session. Um, you know, where people were like, you know, the senators, the senators, congressmen, senators. Have the like, Wi-Fi issues? Can we first knock that out? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yes, that. But but also, it's just like you know, I plugged whatever query into ChatGPT and it gave me you know X answer, right? And like, why did that happen? Yeah. And what you know, what how do I reword the query, right, to get the yeah. you know to get the right answer? Um, so you know, look, the the fact that ChatGPT is fully available, Google now has their Bard AI, you know, out. Microsoft has their Bing AI out. The you know, on the image generation side, Midjourney is now you know completely available, and these other these, these other things like. So these systems are like really wide. Widely, really widely used already. Um, they're very easy to use. And then, of course, um, you know, in, in that third tier of the Douglas Adams scale I was talking about, you know, people do tend to have kids or grandkids, um, and those kids, the kids and grandkids are all using this stuff. Uh, it's a little bit like all that sort of people angry about smartphones or people angry about social media. It's like, well, yeah, but like everybody's using it every day, like, yeah. right? Um, and so, yeah, maybe the other side of it is just at, at some point. Uh, you know, these things become a fait accompli. There's a famous story. U Uber was not one of our companies, so I'm going I'm to I'm talk about them, but I'm going to highlight a, a technique that I certainly would never endorse for our companies, but they did it very effectively, um, which is they had all these battles at the, at the city level to make Uber legal. Um, and uh, so a thing that they would do was uh, they would make sure that there were tons of drivers uh, staged, Uber drivers and cars staged outside City Hall uh, or outside the State House right at 5 o'clock. Um, and so any staffer, you know, at, you know, the New York City, whatever, you know, uh, uh, city government who would come out and, you know, would, would click an Uber, you know, to get to get home, like, the, the car would be there, like, two seconds later. Um, and so there was a whole generation of political staff that were like, okay, I, I, I don't know, I know everybody's <laughs> mad about this. This is the best thing I've ever had in my life. <laughs> right? Um, and so maybe you just need to, maybe this stuff just needs to actually get in people's hands. Uh, I have a couple of uh, young kids, uh, would you promote, uh, you know, young kids use uh, ChatGPT and just like the calculator just becomes an extension of, of the way to access information and, and develop? Yeah, so I should start by saying I have an eight-year-old, so this is a top of mind thing for me also. Um, so a very curious little eight-year-old. Um, I don't know where he got it from, but he got it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, first of all, I would, I would not endorse like eight-year-olds having untrammeled access to everything on the internet. We, we, we watch what he does, you know, pretty carefully. He like does his laptop like sitting right next to me. So he's actually he's actually logged into my Google account, um, so I see everything. Um, but um, I did, yeah, no, I rolled out. Actually, it's funny. I rolled out ChatGPT. I rolled out. Uh, I rolled out ChatGPT, uh, and, I, and I was like, this is great. This is my ultimate peak thing as a father. I'm like bringing, you know, fire down from the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving this kid like the secret code to be able to like succeed in life. Like this is like the most amazing, important thing I'll ever do. And I was like, look, you can ask it any question. It'll answer the question. He's like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you don't understand. Computers don't do this. And he's like, but it's doing it right there on the screen. I'm like, okay, all right. So he's already, you know. That's his baseline. He's already, that's already baseline. Um, he's since informed me, by the way, that that's not the good one. He's informed me that the good one is Bing. Because um, Bing is built into the Edge browser uh, on, his, uh, on his Microsoft Surface. So he's already, he's already trumped me on it. But, but yeah, look, you're, you're, you're basically, you're giving, you train a kid how to use that kind of thing. Like that, that thing in particular, like you, you train them how to do it. And like all of a sudden they're stuck on a problem. You know, they have some issue, you know, trying to, my kid's trying to, starting out learning how to code, and like the minute he has some issue with something or is yeah. curious about something, 
um, to be able to, you know, just to have this superpower. It, like, the way this is going to translate, the way this is going to translate into people's lives is that everybody is going to grow up with an AI that is going to be their best, it's going to be their best friend who's not a person. Their best friend, but it, it's going to be somebody, it's going to be like a best friend relationship. It's going to be, you're, you're going to have a relationship with something that is incredibly sympathetic, incredibly supportive, incredibly concerned about your welfare, incredibly determined to help you succeed, infinitely patient. Right, yeah. willing to help you with any problem, willing to stay up all night to help you with any problem, like never gets tired, never gets frustrated, never gets annoyed, right? Like it's gonna be an amazing support structure and enabling capability for people throughout their entire lives in a way that we just, you know, that we never, that, that we never had. And, and I think that to give that capability to a kid, I think is very powerful. Uh, going down to uh, one step, just in terms of the, the technology questions, um, are, are LLMs fundamentally different than NL, the kind of the NLP revolution that happened, image recognition, or is this just another step? I mean, is this really worth the hype or, or not? Yeah, so the whole AI, AI thing is, you know, the whole AI thing is now the, the big obsession out in the valley, so I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on it. So, so AI's had a funny kind of life trajectory. So a, AI was born as a field immediately after the invention of the computer. So uh, in the 19, 1941, 1942 time period, they immediately started thinking about how to make a so-called human brain. Um, they, they actually had, they, had, they worked on it for about 15 years. They, they made some progress. Um, they actually got government funding. There was a famous event in AI where they got government funding for a 10-week crash program on the Dartmouth campus in the summer of 1956. And they were like, we just need 10 weeks of dedicated effort and we're going to have this solved <laughs> right? in 1956. You'll notice they did not solve it in 1956. Um, so it, it's this old idea. Um, the core technology is this thing called a neural network. Um, and what's interesting about that is the, the neural network paper that invented that concept was written and published in 1943. Um, and the architecture of ChatGPT or MidJourney or Bing AI that you use today is that architecture. And so it's literally an 80-year-old uh, uh, idea that, that's, that's finally working. Um, and, and then basically the story of AI as a field is AI, you know, literally started in like the early 1940s. And then AI ran as a field basically essentially up until 2012 with very little to show for it. Um, and in fact, when I, I was in college in computer science in the late 80s, early 90s, and like the AI department was like in the back of a hall and like we didn't really talk to those people because like the whole field had been like very discredited. They had been promising, you know, AI, bra you know, AI brains for 50 years. They had like nothing to show for it. Um, and so a lot of us kind of thought that this was, this was never going to work. Um, and then basically what happened in 2012, there was a very specific breakthrough with neural networks, which was uh, image recognition, uh, object recognition and images all of a sudden. Computers got really good at that. And that, that was the breakthrough that led to the creation of things like self-driving cars and, and now you know, sort of the new kind of autonomous flight. Um, and then there were successive kind of breakthroughs in the field, in particular around language processing. So natural language recognition, uh, speech synthesis, uh, text-to-speech, speech-to-text. That stuff started to work really well about five or six years ago. Uh, autonomy, I, autonomy actually got really good, right? So actually autonomy, um, you know, the self-driving car is kind of out of the headlines right now, but you know, both Cruise and Waymo now have gone for 24-hour approval. They're, they've been running a robotaxi service in San Francisco at night, and they're now both applying for 24-7. Uh, uh, so they're, they're, they're not fully running. And then, uh, you know, t the Tesla, um, you know, tes Tesla's, like, people are doing full, self somebody did a full Tesla full self-driving trip all the way from San Francisco to Los Angeles with, uh, with no, um, no, no, no disengagements, and including through traffic in San Francisco and L.A. Um, and so, th th anyway, I mentioned that because that's the payoff from the breakthroughs that started in, in, in 2012. Like, that stuff's all working now. Um, and then there was this LLM breakthrough basically, you know, probably originally four years ago. And then, but even as late as the fall of 2022, I think people still didn't quite expect, even people working on it were not, this is not actually quite going to work right. And then they did the training, they did the training runs on what's now called GPT-3 and they were just like, whoa, like this really works. And so our, our, our whole world, the whole world out, out in California is just like completely obsessed now with, with, this, with this breakthrough. Oh, and then correspondingly the image breakthrough. Like if you haven't tried Midjourney, which is the one of the leading image things right now, like it's just like it, the quality of the art that it creates is just astonishing. It's just it's really special, um, and it's going to be it's going to be video. It's going to be video. It's, the video uh, work is happening right now, um, and so you know, video production in the future is going to be you're going to describe the video scene that you want, and the, the computer will render it. Right. And so literally, the way that people will make movies in the future is they'll just literally write the screenplay, and then the computer will turn the screenplay into the video. And you'll skip all those pesky intermediate steps involving things like actors and lighting and so forth. Um, and so, like, this is all this is happening. Like, it's it, it's happening right now. So, it, it, yeah. And, and I guess maybe the other, the other thing I just say is like, it, it is it is enormous shock and surprise to the upside that this is working as well as it is right now. And so, the, there's a rush of talent into the field happening right now. And if you just kind of track the the trajectory right now, like, I mean, right, well, it's a couple of things. So one is I see new things every day right now that just cause my jaw to go up to the floor, right? Just like, break, break, there's like a breakthrough a day right now. 
But then, other words, do things taking yeah. uh, LLMs and applying them to like workflows, or is it like just fundamentally new things? Well, so I'll give you I'll give you an example. So if you try Chat if you try ChatGPT or Bing or one of these things, there, there's the, they have a concept. There's a concept called a context window, which you don't see as a user, but I'll just I'll describe what it is. So the context window basically is the amount of text that you can input into the thing as as input into your query, and then it's the amount of text that it can generate. You know, kind of coming out the other side. And the, the so-called context window for the systems that you have access to today, it's like four, it's, it's, it's denominated in tokens, and you could think about tokens as like syllables, for example, right? So it's like 4,000 syllables worth of context. You know, so the, the, these things can kind of process 4,000 syllables, or call it 3,000 and 2,500 words at a time, right? And so you, and you see that. You can, you can punch in several paragraphs of text, but you can't punch in several pages of text. It can produce several paragraphs of text. It can produce the same amount on the other side. Um, the Bing got upgraded recently. There's a tweak you can do where you take the context window up to 12,000 symbols, which is about eight or 9,000 words. That's getting to be, you know, pretty big multi multiple, you know, couple pages of, of material. Um, there's a company called Anthropic, which is a split off from uh, OpenAI um, that has a, a, new, a new LLM competitor to OpenAI um, called, called Claude. Um, and uh, they just uh, upgraded the Claude context window to 100,000 tokens, which is equivalent to about 70,000 words. Which is the size of a small book, um, or a large, you know, paper. And so what? So, so, what so happens you can you... put a book into this thing, um, and at least in theory, you can tell it generate the sequel to the book. <laughs> now, it doesn't quite do that today, but like that, yeah. that is like within shooting distance now. Like that, we, we can now see how to do that. Uh, you, if you're a financial analyst, you can dump in, you know, a whole. You can dump in the last ten years worth of SEC reports in a company, and, and then you know have it do real time analysis. And that's what happens with a million tokens or two million or three. Million. Yeah, and then there was a breakthrough. There was a yeah. So there was a there was a paper that came out over the weekend um, where they. So there's going to be a shift in the technology where they're going to go from right now. The way the technology works is it predicts the next token, which is like predicting, like I said, the next syllable. The, there's going to be an architecture shift where it's going to predict the next byte, which is going to make it even more uh, precise in, in its answers. And then there was a paper that came out this weekend that showed how to have the context window be a million bytes long, right? Um, and, and then basically said that's not the upper bound. Like if you can do a million bytes, basically there's a scaling model where you can get to five million, you know, five megabytes or 10 megabytes at a time. And so you're gonna be able to dump in, you know, it, it's looking like you're gonna be able to dump in multiple large books, uh, you know, and have them process against single queries and then get output out the other side. And so the, the, the scope of how this will be useful you know, is just bananas. I'll give you another example. We met with a we met with a company um, that basically is um, <laughs> since you said fairly amazing. Um, they have an approach. They are gathering um, uh, camera. They're gathering sensor data. They're gathering camera data, um, and they're 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 using the scene description. The object I mentioned the breakthrough in objects in, in recognizing objects and images. And so they're having the object and image algorithms basically describe what's in the the camera scene as it's happening, and then they're feeding and training an LLM on that in real time. And so all of a sudden you can talk to your security system, yeah. right? And you can say like, I don't know, was that guy, you know, have you seen that guy before? It's like, you know, well, actually, no, he was here yesterday at, you know, 3.05 p.m. You know, it's like, well, what did he do? It's like, I don't know, he was circling the building and trying to see if the doors are open, right? And it's like, well, why didn't you tell me? And it's like, well, you didn't tell me to tell you, right? And, <laughs> well, I want you to tell me next time. And it's like, okay, I'll remember that, right? And that, and that will be the interaction model, yeah. right? And so, so you, this is what's called multimodal, multimodal processing. So you'll be able to feed images and video into these things. Just like you feed in text, and so anyway, so this this is rolling. Like this technology is rolling. It's rolling at a high rate of speed. I think there's going to be. I think we're looking at ten or twenty or thirty years of advances from here. Yeah, I'm mean, very much. I remember in uh, college where somebody was like, "Oh, I can't believe I just got a computer with two gigs," and you know the whole dorm was excited about that. And it, that's probably the million token thing now. Sounds big today. It, probably in five or ten years, we're going to look back and it's going to be very small. Yeah, I, I, like, I think when my, by the time my kid grows up, he may just it may just be a mystery to him that you ever had to decide what text to put in because yeah. it just you know you just dump everything in, you can show it everything. How do you think this changes the you know the future of conflict? Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, this technology is all like you know completely directly you know relevant to 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 um, you know to, to all kinds of you know everything involving the, the you know the entire world of defense and intelligence. Well, look. So I mean, just you know for for starters, like the entire world of intelligence and intelligence analysis analysis is going to go you know upside down. It's going to it's going to work completely differently in the future. Uh, so <laughs> this is I think through the implications of this. And so right, the way that intelligence analysis works today, right, is, is this mass data gathering you know kind of exercise of all these kinds of intelligence, and then there's this whole analysis pipeline with all these incredibly highly skilled and trained and smart people who are kind of sifting through everything. And they've got some computer support for it, but fundamentally they're sifting through trying to find patterns. And then they kind of, they develop, you know, the, the people develop hypotheses, they try to kind of prove the hypothesis, they write a report, they try to assess the probability of, of the thing. Um, and if, you know, and if they're really smart and if they're on top of everything that they do, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, usefully predictive. And, you know, if, if they're not or if they're just wrong, it, it, you know, it ends up not mattering. 
Um, with LLMs, there's a completely different way to do it, which is you just dump in all the raw intelligence, um, and then you just ask it, like, what are the what are the top ten like most dangerous possible terror plots that are being like you know possibly assembled right now, right? And it's and and, the, and what the what the what the LLM can do is just like cross correlate everything, right? And so it's like, well, over here we have this signal intelligence with this travel pattern, with this with this camera image, and oh by the way, you know this guy, so this guy newly arrived from country X, you know he's been spending an awful lot of time circling around the local sports stadium. Right, like you know, yep. like you know, put they all put that on the top ten list, right? You should probably pay attention to that, right? And so it's just like a, com a completely different and far more powerful way, you know, to do this, where the, where the machine is doing all of the sort of heavy lifting, so that the people can actually be looking at the results and applying judgment. So uh, you're a staffer, you're uh, uh, in the Pentagon, uh, you're in the military, you know, folks like that in the audience. If you're building an organization from scratch with that, with those types of uh, assets, it would look very different yeah. than the current organization. So if you are in the DOD, how do you readjust, or you're in an agency, how do you readjust your thinking to this technology? Because the technology is evolving simultaneously. And then the same thing applies to private industry if you're a car company. How do you deal with this, uh, this, this technology? What would you do? So the, the same question actually is playing out, let's talk about it first, playing out in Silicon Valley. Um, because we have this entire generation of companies that were basically formed and created before this technology existed. SaaS, basically. Uh, SaaS, SaaS companies. And then, and then, by the way, just like companies that are structured with like, you know, the executive teams and managers and, you know, designers and developers yep. and, you know, QA departments and customer support people. But like, just think about it yourself as an entrepreneur. Like if, uh, you know, if, if you knew that you had this capability or if you knew you had this capability, like in two years, this, it's going to take a couple years to polish, you know, everything that I'm talking about because this is also brand new. But in a couple years, you're going to be able to buy off the shelf, you know, uh, you know you, AI. Well, actually, we already have a company that's cut over to LLM for customer support. We have a travel company that's already done it. And the customers are much happier, and the answers are much better. Um, and it's obviously, it's, it's obviously a lot cheaper. It's much better for the business. So, um, so, so I, you know, so look, I, I think, like, even tech companies are going to get reorganized. Like, yeah. how they operate, like, what are the jobs going to be, right? How are the people, you know, just like the intelligence example, like, what are the people going to do, and how is the machine going to help them? I mean, would you just look at, uh, let's, say, let's say you are in a large bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, would you look at work, uh, how would you even uh, tackle that problem? Do you look at workflows first? Because I think in the private SaaS sector, if you're just doing basic workflows and you're charging X dollars per license and you can have this new interface on top and then everything gets abstracted away and it's much cheaper, that's a fundamental threat to your company. But the DOD is not going away. So what do you do in that situation? Yeah, well, so first, look, your choice of vendor, I think, is, you know, your choice of partner, I think, is, is going to change, right? And so, the, like, I just say, this technology is going to move very fast from here. It is virtually, it, like, it's actually interesting. A lot of the actual inventions actually came in big industrial research labs um, yeah. <laughs> that did not necessarily productize the technology, which is, which is an old story. Um, but now what's going to happen is the innovation is mostly going to arrive in the form of, it's going to arrive in the form of new companies. It would be new companies um, uh, with, with new products, with new approaches that are going to get built from scratch. Uh, for this, and I think that that's been true of everything AI for the last decade, and I think it will continue to be true. So, you know, there, there's a, just a huge question here about choice of partner, choice of vendor. Um, you know, where this technology is going to actually come from. Um, yeah, and then look, it, 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 there are many, many different ways to reinvent. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, the hardest thing in the world is to reinvent an existing giant bureaucracy. You know, look, that said, you know, spinning up new, you know, new teams, spinning up new red cells, you know, spinning up new efforts, um, you that know. completely orthogonal to these existing systems. Yeah, and at least having, you know, the, the, the big thing we always, well, the big thing we always encourage in our companies, as well as in, in, in large organizations, is just like, there, there should be room to experiment. There, need, there needs to be room to experiment. There needs to be room to be able to do something new, to be able to try something new. You know, the, the, the good news with that is, you know, the trying something new thing should be much, much cheaper, right? To, yeah. Like, it's, it's not, you know, it, like, you want to actually keep the team size small, right? You want to keep the effort contained. So you have a set of analysts, you actually create a new team, and you yeah. say you use new technology, you're much smaller, limited resources, see what you can do, and come yeah. back with the results. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Interesting. The, um, it's, it's, it's stepping more into just defense technology and procurement, um, next year, fiscal year 2024, the DOD budget's over $800 billion. Um, it's driven mainly by this kind of strategic competition uh, with China, but uh, you know, public markets are still dicey. Tech is going through its own uh, kind of reconciliation. Um, what reforms do you think need to be made to help founders who are entering this uh, market to access these defense dollars? I think you are seeing a shift in the valley where you have more companies trying to get defense dollars and working actively in defense. And I don't know when or why that happened, but I think Maybe the low point was the pro, you know, Project Maven Google kind of debacle, and now I think we're kind of uh, entering a new new era. But yeah, how do you how do you think about that? Founders, founders, uh, and the reforms need needed in order to kind of access these dollars. Yeah, so let's see if I can do this. Let's see the good, the bad, the good, and the bad. 
it's a complex topic, so I'm going to try a four-part four answer. So the so the good so the good is look the the the, 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 the DoD in particular, like with the third offset, right, has 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 I think very widely identified that you know autonomy and AI is 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 critically important to the level of being being an offset. So. Um, you know, there's a level of, I think, strategic understanding that actually, it, you know, in many ways actually led some of this innovation. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a pretty deep level of understanding um, at the strategic level about some of the things that are about to happen and the need to, to directly confront it. Um, the bad is, I think, uh, anytime the word reform comes up, I just translate that to impossible. Um, like, I, I always notice, like, the linguistics are always funny. It's, it's like, okay, like, if my kid is cranky in the morning, I change his bedtime. I don't reform it. <laughs> Right, like, um, like, why do we say reform? We say reform because we know it like has to be changed, but it can't, because otherwise we would just change it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but the favorite story I love telling about mili military reform, I'm sure people here have heard this, but um, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld uh, gave a speech in on uh, September 10th, uh, 2001, a big speech uh, that he spent months preparing, um, and it was a speech on his, in his view, uh, you know, and have he been previous defense secretary and studied the issues for decades. It was his view of the, the single most important strategic enemy of the United States, the single most important strategic threat that we face. Um, it's this huge wind-up, and of course, the, the, the speech was all about Pentagon bureaucracy. Um, he gave the speech on September 10th. Of course, it's as if he never gave the speech. Um, yeah. 22 years later, we're on stage. What reforms <laughs> need yeah. to happen in military procurement? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we'll be having the same conversation, you know, 22 years from now. Like, th so I, I'm not, I'm not optimistic on on, on that stuff. Um, but so if that's the case, uh, then, then I mean, we'll go back to the yeah. good. So then I'll go to the third, the good, the good. So the, the, the good is, look, there there are very very smart people, not just at the strategic level, like I mentioned before, but also at the tactical level, the implementation level. And so there are there are programs, DIUX, um, um, and then um, you know, Incatel at the at the at the agency, and you know, and then a bunch of smart people at the at the working level, a bunch of a bunch of you know, individual units and pockets of money and, and prototype efforts, uh, you know, places where you can prototype things. And so there, there are more and more people, I think, at, the, at, at that level kind of figuring this out and, and that you can work with. Um, and then I would just say the bad, or maybe this is also the good, which is I think the ultimate answer to this is on our side of the table, which is just like we have to bring products into this space that are so overwhelmingly good you know, that they sort of justify, um, you know, kind of working their way into the system. Like the, 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 the you know, we, we need to live up to our marketing and we, we need to bring the products that are like actually, you know, translate the hype into like, oh my God, like this thing really is revolutionary. And if we have this, it's really gonna make a huge difference. And I think if, if, we, if we do that, I think our, our company Yeah, how do you do that? Do I mean, the, the internet does this in the consumer side, right? The old uh, Bill Gates line about bring the consumer and the buyer closer and closer together, removing the middleman equals much more efficiency. And that's what, you know, Amazon and, and the internet has done. How do you do that in the, procurement realm, um, you know, if reform is going to be too difficult, what, 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 what do you do? And you have pockets of, of, of let's say, positivity, but yeah, what would you do? You're, you're the head of the uh, uh, DOD procurement wing. You've been, you're no longer at Andreessen Horowitz. Yeah. This is your first objective. What do you do? I just I go, to the, I go to the new vendors and I say, look, you've got to bring me the products that are so fantastic. So uh, Steve Martin, in another domain, unrelated domain, but one of my favorite, people ask me for career advice, and so I always tell them what Steve Martin said, a uh, com comedian, stand-up comedian. He wrote this great book called Born Standing Up, yeah. where he talks about how he became a successful stand-up comedian, and he says he gets asked by stand-up comedians, how do, how do you succeed in the business? And he said, oh, it's easy. Be so good they can't ignore you. Right, and of course, that's the advice nobody wants, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's depressing, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but like, you know, that, that is the actual like route to success. And, and I think it's true here as well, which is I just think, I think the, the, the capabilities have to be so incredibly powerful. You know, they, they have to really provide a, 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 a definitive jump, um, you know, that's just completely clear. And so, so that it just kind of becomes obvious. Like I said, fait accompli. It's like the Uber story. Like it just becomes a fait accompli. It's just like, oh, obviously we need this. Yeah. Obviously, we need to go, you know, buck the system to do it. We need to go convince people. Obviously, whatever is, you know, we need to be able to go through whatever barriers, you know, we just, this really, really matters. And I, th I think that just, I think that's just like 10x more important than, than everything else. Yeah, do you think that is uh, like a, uh, our ability to procure this technology then becomes its own strategic advantage in the world? The ability to identify this technology and actually bring it in? Or? It could be. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's not now, but it could be. Yeah. yeah. The, um, this AI race, you know, um, it should have a similar urgency to like the atomic bomb and the Manhattan Project. And are these correct parallels or incorrect parallels? And again, we have audience members who are you know wrangling with this question right now. What, what's your recommendation? Yeah. So look, AI. So like, I, I'm gonna be clear. Like, I'm not gonna take any credit for what's happened in AI because, like I said, when I was in school, we didn't take it seriously. So like, um, uh, like it is a, it is a shock and surprise to a lot of us that it's working as well as it is. Um, and then, you know, that we're, that we're now so convinced that it's going to work much better from here. So I, I do think this is one of those things. 
Um, it's just going to be really important. Um, and I think you can already see why it's going to be really important. And then I think it's going to get much, much better, which is going to make it even clearer. It's going to be more important. So, you know, analogies are always dangerous, but, you know, I, th I think it's in the category of internet. I think it's in the category of microchip, right? M maybe even microchip more than internet because microchip, you know, kind of everything, everything ultimately got chip, you know, everything has a chip. Um, you know, mic microprocessors kind of control everything in the modern world. I think AI is going to be the control, basically, layer for everything running on top of chips, uh, you know, in the future. Electricity, I think, is not a stretch as a comparison. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's going to be a, um, I think it's going to be a, um, yeah, I think it's going to be an incredibly important thing. The, um, and or what was the other part of the question? You I mean, I mean, do we, do we create a Manhattan oh, Project? Oh, Manhattan Project, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, the comparison to nukes. So, um, yeah, so the, pro the, the, the problem with the Manhattan Project, uh, uh, and, uh, and I, love, I love the history of the Manhattan Project, um, uh, but um, it was a long time ago. Um, and there's a reason why we're still use it as the metaphor and the example, because there was not another one since, yeah. right? Like, and that, that was, you know, again, 80 years ago. Um, and so, and, and I just think like the, the people are talking about this right now, like a Manhattan Project for AI. It, the problem is like the Manhattan Project happened at a point in time when the government could directly run a project, you know, with, with a combination of Groves and, and Oppenheimer. Um, and then they could, they could literally, and you know, part of it was it was in, 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 a, in a war, in a, you know, in a, <laughs> a big one. Um, and they, they could get basically the best and brightest people in that technical field, you know, and they could basically, you know, grab them and plant them in Los Alamos and, and they could... And they point could, them towards a national They interest. could make them do that. And by the way, there were no nuclear bomb startups, right? Like, yeah. you know, it's still, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you didn't have a... You didn't have a, if you're going to work on, you know, if you're going to work on nuclear, you were going to you were, you were go there and do it. And so they had a monopoly on the best and brightest, right? And, they, and you know, of course, it was literally the best and brightest from all over the world. Um, you know, they're bringing all these incredible people over from, from Europe and so forth. And so it was just a, it was a time and a place and a way of operating that I think is just not practical today. Um, and so I, th I think practically speaking, what has to happen today is a, is a public-private partnership. Um, um, you know, look, chi and China, look, China, <laughs> China, China also, China has a model of public-private partnership. Um, their form of public-private partnership is that their public sector, the party, owns all of the private companies and <laughs> tells them exactly what to do. Um, but a partnership. So, yeah, that's the partnership uh, is, is, yes, do what I want. Um, you know, we, the problem, the advantage of the Chinese system is it does have some of that old Manhattan Project command and control. And they, they do have a whole national push towards AI as part of that, um, which is going to dramatically accelerate from here. Um, you know, our private part, part, uh, the advantage of our public-private partnership is uh, we, we just have a much greater diversity of, of private companies. You know, we have much more innovation. We have much more creativity just because, we, you know, we live in a, in a freer society um, and, with, you know, with, a, with at least a <laughs> more capitalism. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we just, we have a higher rate of development overall. It's just we, we, we lack the centralized coordination. Um, and, you know, when push comes to shove, sometimes that, that, that does really matter. So, yeah, so kind of how to take the system that we have and how to harness the gains from it, right, and sort of get, get the payoff from the dynamism of the American economy and the American private sector system, um, but still come out the other end with a coherent strategy. How are you guys doing it? I mean, in many ways, you are a resource allocator, uh, uh, and uh, how are you looking at, you know, I want to, for the lack of a better word, monetize this, uh, this fundamental technical shift what do you do? Do you just are you just meeting every AI company, or do you have a thesis-driven approach? What's the what's your what's your process? Is it centrally controlled by a couple of partners who are AI partners, or does every partner think about this? How do you think about it? Yeah, so the, the way we run, so we, we we run a funnel. The way you think about it is the way a venture capital operation runs is you kind of run this is funnel, and so you've got you've got kind of at the top of the funnel, you've got all the all the all the new entrepreneurs and all the people being referred to you, and we probably see on the order of five thousand companies a year um, that kind of work their way, you know, start at the top of the funnel and then down to the bottom of the funnel. There's like fifty investments or something, so it's like a one in one hundred or something, and and the top of the funnel is qualified by the way, so it's 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 always somebody referred in by somebody we know, um, so it's not even you know it's not even cold approaches. Um, and so basically what we do is we, we work our way through the funnel, we try to meet with everybody, we try to have, we try to understand what everybody's doing. We try have to, you seen a big shift into this space? Yeah, yeah. And, and I'd, I'd say just starting now. Like the, it's, it, it was really the Christmas, it was really Christmas 2020, 2022 when people actually sat down and really used GPT yeah. and really used Midjourney and they were like, oh, hello. A couple yeah. of weeks of vacation, we'll get you that. Yes, yes, I came back from that completely fired up, as did a lot of people. So. Um, so, uh, yeah, we work through it. And then, you know, we, we study as much as we can. We talk to experts. Um, you know, we talk to customers. We're out here a lot, uh, you know, talking to folks. Um, and, you know, we study everything. We try to develop a very strong point of view. 
you know, we try to market maps and, you know, value chains and like all this stuff. And then basically what we do is we throw all that away. We meet with the founder <laughs> and the founder, you know, what we're waiting for is the founder to walk in the room and just explain to us, look, I know you guys think that you know what you're doing, but like, I really know what I'm doing and here's how the world's going to work and here's what I'm going to build. And basically you're an idiot if you don't fund me. Um, like that's the best case scenario for us. So you're not um, doing like an AI partner who knows everything. Well, yeah, we do that. Yeah, we do that. Yeah. So we do that. Well, the, the risk in our business is we, we only get to fund one company in a sector. So we, we, cause, uh, our, our companies get very touchy if we fund their competitors, they get very, yeah. they get very <laughs> upset with us. Um, so, so our risk always, we have, you know, the risk is just that we'll miss something, but the other risk is we'll, we will get the trend right. And we'll, we'll invest in the wrong company. So a lot of what we're trying to do is figure out who the, who the winner is going to be. And you, if you generally know where the industry is going just yeah. based on research and then within that context, you're picking the winner. Well, we try to fund, basically we try to fund anything where it's like a, a lot, where there's like a, a, a group of smart people who are like really deeply qualified in the domain who are like have sniffed out something yeah. where they're like, okay, you know, and they're, they're not even necessarily, they don't need to even know each other or whatever, but like there's this thing where, I mean, sometimes it's just one person, but sometimes it's like a, a, a scene of people um, and they just kind of say, okay, look, you know, we're gonna, there's, there's, there's something here, there's an idea here and then we have a, a the, you know, we have the kinds of people who would be able to go do that. What do you that. mean by scene of people? Scene. I think that's obvious, oh. uh, yeah. You know, obviously well, it's actually there. relevant out here, equally relevant out here also. So this is a Stuart, this old Stuart Brand thing. Um, so there, this, this gets philosophical, but this question of like, what is the nature of human genius? Like, right? What, what's the what? You know, there's sort of the stereotype of the genius, the solo genius. You know, usually Einstein with the with the hair sitting in his you know sitting in his, his room. The hair know. part's important. The right? hair part's very important. The hair <laughs> and the ratty sweater. Um, well, the Einstein story, right? And he's rocking his kid. He's working as a patent clerk, and he's at night. And then he like has this. He's like relativity, relativity, and it's like Eureka. And the light bulb, you know, in the cartoon, the light bulb goes off over his head, and it's like the, the lone genius had the breakthrough. Like, what almost always happens is not that. What almost always happens is there was a group of people. It, it's all. It's like the idea was in the air, and the reason the idea was in the air is because there were a group of very smart people who maybe knew each other, maybe didn't, who were kind of circling around the thing uh, at the time the discovery was made. Um, and and. Um, and, and so the, Stuart Brand uh, had this term uh, he calls senius. Um, and so senius is a combination of seen and genius. Or you might, just, uh, you might just describe it more uh, sort of plainly as just like uh, collective genius, right? Or like group genius or social genius, right? So it's like n none of us is actually an island. You know, we, we, all, we all learn from each other um, and we all build on each other. Uh, and so the idea of senius basically is, you know, sometimes the group is smarter than the individual. And so, yeah, so the, and the best, and you often see this in startup world, right? You often see this where it's like, okay, there isn't just one founder doing something, there's like 10, and they're all really smart. And none of them have proven what they're about to do, but they've all reached the point kind of, you know, individually, collectively, where they've figured out that there's probably something going on here. Like, that's at the point. We, we, we then try to fund the best company at that, that we can find at that time of that thing. Now, that's still pre any of them proving necessarily that the thing, thing is going to work, but, but generally speaking, if those kinds of people are on something, Generally speaking, that's that's. Good. I, I would argue in tech. I would argue the ideas are actually pretty obvious. Like, they're not necessarily predictable, but like they're not that. Like, when so, again, Uber because it wasn't one of ours. It's like when Travis Kalanick walks in the room and he's like, "Yeah, what if you could press a button and a car just like pulls up?" It's like, "Oh, that sounds great, right?" Like, it, now we have to do it. It yeah. wasn't a giant leap. It was it, all the complexity was actually in, in providing that service and and doing everything else around it. Um, and so I think I think our job it, in a lot of ways is just going to be alert to the obvious. Um, and then try to you know pick the people who have a good chance of proving it. And you know we're, we're wrong a lot of the time. Like we back things that don't work. We back things that are early a lot of the time. But you know the, the ones that work work. So uh, turning back to uh, uh, defense here, um, the uh, last year on, on the stage, you argued that you know humans are pretty terrible uh, decision makers, and autonomous technologies can perform kind of several functions. Uh, this like AI augmenting a human, including in war fighting. Um, Ukraine. You know we've had another year of Ukraine. Uh, do you think the events there have validated that thinking, or has it changed your thinking just very tactically? Yeah, there's, so there's two kind of tentative conclusions that I draw from Ukraine so far that are relevant to, to the stuff that I'm talking about. And I would say they're, they're tentative because it's you know, still playing out. But um, so one is just, I mean, look, it, it, it is an incredible um, you know, sort of case study of the application of autonomy and, and you know, new advanced technologies on, on, on the battlefield. And you know, you, you'd have to highlight there specifically like the anti-tank weapons and their, you know, the, their success in the field. Um, you know, the javelins, um, uh, 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 you know, the use of drones, um, you know, which is, has really picked up relative to prior conflicts. Um, and then also um, uh, the overnight, I don't know, I, I don't know whether this is true, but overnight there's a report that a, a Patriot battery took down a, a Russian hypersonic missile. Uh, which I, th I think is a first. Um, yeah, and that's not human controlled. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, that's not, it's not a human. It's not a human <laughs> with the joystick intercepting an ultra uh, yeah. a, a hypersonic. And so, um, 
So you know there there is a story playing out of like autonomy in practice. Um, I think at a level that 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 is new, um, and, and and you know and I think it's working. And to the extent that, that it works, um, you know it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna kind of double underline, you know, kind of the need for the entire defense ecosystem to kind of really really think hard about these things. You know, the other, and I think this is a, a good news story for in terms of in terms of you know our interests is um, America's interest is that um, it, it does appear that uh, you know defense trumps offense. Um, it, it appears that the current state of the art in modern technology uh, is defense has an advantage over offense. And of course, you want to qualify that as saying <laughs> this assumes that the enemy is not just trying to completely obliterate everything, right? It, yeah. you know, it assumes that they're trying to like capture something. Um, but I, you know, I think you, you could you could say basically, and, and you could go back further. You could say Ukraine. You could also say Iraq and Afghanistan and the Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan in the '80s were all instances where ultimately the defenders had a big edge versus the attackers, like the, the defenders basically. How do you deal with the situation where, uh, let's you know, the Patriot missile, the hypersonic example is maybe a bad one, but if it's a cheap drone and you have a very expensive munition that you're using to take down that drone. Uh, what do you look at that? How do you look at that balance, especially in the context of autonomous systems can be very expensive? Well, so the other, so let's talk about the other side of it first. So the other side of it is a Russian tank, right, with yeah, a, with a tank happen. crew being taken out by a man pad or something like that, right? And so there the economics are working for you. Yeah. As the defender, the economics are working for you. It is cheaper for you to take out the tank than it was for them to field the tank. Yeah. Um, and, and by the way, not just in material, but also in, in there's actually men in the tank. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I do think there is a lot of that playing out. But yeah, look, there are these other cases where, yeah, where the, the, the defense is actually very expensive. And yeah, dr drones are going to really highlight this, right? The, the, the inexpensive drones, you know, being taken out by the, well, or what was it? The, the ultimate example was the Chinese, um, uh, the Chinese balloon uh, yeah. that was taken out by a if, Tomahawk <laughs> yeah. missile, right? It's like the most expensive balloon <laughs> deflation, take, in, the world. deflation in, the, in the world, right? Um, and so, yeah, so, yeah, so if you're, if you're using like an incredibly expensive uh, capability to take out cheap attacks, like obviously that's not that's not sustainable. Um, yeah, and then again, I think that just that double underlines the need. Okay, so that means that those defensive capabilities they need to get to a new generation of technology that can be fielded much more cheaply. Yeah. So cost is a relevant uh, concern. Yeah. So for example, drones taking out drones, right, yeah. as compared to Tomahawk missiles taking out drones or something like that. Um, there's a lot. Of, uh, speaking of China, uh, a lot of fear that China's catching up or surpassed us in AI. Um, what do you think our policymakers are getting right about China? W w what are we getting wrong? Yeah, so I think the good news is, I think, just from my perspective, is I think people are alert to the threat. Um, I, I will tell you, I actually had, I had, the, I had the first legitimately optimistic bipartisan interaction in politics in ever, forever, 20 years. Uh, I met with the, the, the new Congressional China Committee came out to Silicon Valley, um, spent some time at Stanford, and I, and, I, and I met with them. And it was, it was remarkable. It was like, it was, it, was, it was kind of like, it was like, you know, cats and dogs, you know, li living together. It was like, <laughs> the Democrats and Republicans were like, smiling at each other and talking and saying nice things about each other. It was really weird. Um, and so uh, they were very unified, um, and so it, it, it is this thing where it, feel, it feels like an awareness of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the potential challenges um, and then a willingness to come together across party lines or have, have, you know, have it be less of a partisan issue. Uh, those are in full effect right now. So those, from my perspective, those both seem like you know, big, big steps forward. You know, look, I, I think the biggest problem just remains the biggest problem, which is like, okay, so now what? Um, you know, what's our, what's our strat like, what, you know, what is the national China strategy? Right, and again, the advantage of the Chinese system is they have they have a national strategy. Like they've got a national strategy for everything that that that, that has you know bad aspects and good aspects. Um, you know, we, we do not have a national China strategy. Uh, you know, far from it. Um, and then you know we we also don't have a national technology strategy. Like we don't have anything even re resembling a national technology strategy. It was one of my favorite questions to ask to torture people in government. It's like, okay, what's the U.S. national technology strategy? Sweat collar. Um, so, do you think we should have one explicitly? I don't know. Or so, is it the capitalist system that allows you know the right things to kind of bubble up and percolate? Yeah. So historically, right, the American story. Historically, the American story is um, no. The problem we're not coordinated in that way. But as a consequence, we have this thriving free market system, and we have a marketplace of ideas, and we have all these smart people running around doing all these things. And then you know when push comes to shove, we've got this just enormous reservoir of creativity and innovation and production capability, and we can we can harness it and we can bring it to bear. And you know, look, it, it can take time. Um, you know, it, it, it can take time to spin up. Um, uh, you know, and it can. You know, it, you know, when the, when the shooting starts, like you, you have to kind of catch up, make up for lost time. But you know, but the, but then you get the payoff from it, and like there's a reason why we tend to do so well. Um, you know, when, when we get into the thick of these things, is because you know the, the capabilities come to bear. 
you know, but but I would say then we just we need to want that system to work, right? We need to want the free market system to work. Um, you know, we, we very practically we need new vendors to be supported by that system. Um, you know, we 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 need we do need when when things get tense, we do need the right kind of leadership. Um, and and again, we need we need all this on the on the on the Valley side, California side, just as much as we need it in D.C. You know, we also need leaders on the Valley side that understand the importance of these missions and, and, and standing up for them and not you know thinking that they're above all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we need all that. It's yeah, I, I you know it's not great right now. Like I don't think on any of those fronts it's all that great right now. But you know may, maybe maybe the answer is just the intensity of the challenge. Right, Maybe, you know, we, we will. Yeah, I, I'm confident we can rise to any challenge. It's just a question of like. Okay. Yeah, if you if you fast forward five uh, years, let's say ten years, the center of AI globally is it still the Bay? I mean, right now for this short amount of time, the Bay Area seems to be it. But is that in China? Is that somewhere else? I mean, it should. This is again, it goes, goes to like it should be here. Like it's all here now. It should be here. Um, here being the U.S. United States, the United yeah. States, yeah. Like we're way out, we're way out ahead. Like we're the United States is way out ahead in terms of R and D on this, on this, just like we've been in many other things. Um, and um, you know, it it ought to be here. Um, you know, there was just a case. You know, look, but look, China's doing what China does. You know, this guy just got arrested this week. Uh, just announced. Uh, you know, a senior engineer at, at Apple got arrested. Uh, I just fled the country. Actually, he's back in China, but he's a Chinese national who was working at Apple and apparently gave them transferred all the Apple self-driving car source code back to back to Beijing. And so, like the, the Chinese are doing what they do, um, and you know. And by the way, and by the way, the American companies are not exactly locked down from a counter espionage standpoint. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, and so, you know, like yeah, we, we ought to be we, we we ought to be the we are the leaders in this stuff now. We ought to be the leaders of this stuff in the future. We ought to always be on the leading edge. Um, you know, yeah. Do we do we want to be? You know, there, there's just, I would say there's a very big underlying question, which is, do we want to be? You know, to, to what extent do we want this? You know, this big again, the big hearings on the Hill yesterday is like, do we want AI to be legal in the U.S.? Like, do we want that? Do we want actual free market competition? Do we, you know, do we want startups to succeed? You know, what do we want? Do we want? Do we want our military to have the best leading edge technology? Right. These are all these are all actual serious like in questions yeah. of, in, of intent that I think are fuzzy right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, you know, in the context of applied, we, we think about this with competitors, and one of the comments that uh, one of our uh, engineering leads said is, you know, we could publish our product documents, but it doesn't mean someone else can just do them, you know, can actually build the product. So I think there's some analogy there where the Apple engineer can steal, you know, the, the, the let's say the source code, but that doesn't necessarily mean you get a self-driving car. There's a lot more uh, than, than just that. But maybe you get leading edge LiDAR five yeah. years sooner than you would have, right? Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. It, it, the world is also not moral. I mean, you know, the Manhattan Project, the side effect of the Manhattan Project yeah. was that, you know, the Russians got the bomb. Yeah. Like, we designed it. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so some, some uh, certain lessons there. Yeah. Um, last area we want to talk about, uh, you know, covered a lot, but really talk about entrepreneurship. And, uh, and so last year at the same stage, you described, you know, regulatory bodies, oligopolies uh, being pro-market versus pro-business and kind of the cartels that kind of make it difficult for incumbents just in the Bay Area, the, the Googles and the Amazons versus the, versus the startups um, to enter markets like education, transportation. What about defense? Do you think the same holds true for defense? Uh, are the incumbents, you know, positive, negative? Uh, how, how do you think about that? Or how do you recommend a founder sitting across you in the, in the market uh, think about this? Yeah, so this, I'll recap briefly maybe what I said last year. Um, so, so basically, like, you, you have, people have this idealized model of sort of tooth and claw capitalism where sort of everything's a free market and everything's being battled out in the market. And that's either, by the way, some people think that's good, some people think that's bad. But people kind of think that's what's happening. And when people say they're pro-capitalist or pro-business, that's what they think they, they, they mean. Um, what ends up happening in reality in most markets is something very different than that. Um, and specifically, it's a, you know, it, it would, it, especially when it gets in, involved with the government, it, it's the concept called regulatory capture. Right, and so it's sort of this idea that at some point, whoever are the leaders in the field of whatever industry, at some point they come to Washington and they basically appeal for, and you know they don't say, hey, we want regulatory capture and a permanent, you know, permanent monopoly. What they say is, oh, you know, we think it's time that the field be regulated, you know, for you know, the consumer's best interests, right? Um, and then let's let's just let's see if we can write the regulations in a way that just like makes it very clear that we are the only companies, right? The the current leaders are going to be the only companies that are going to be allowed to operate. You know, in this industry, uh, you know, basically forever, and that there will therefore never be challenges from from new entrants. The incredible example of that that's playing out right now is in banking. Um, so, the big conclusion after 2008 that everybody had, to the point where it literally became the title of the book, 
Too Big to Fail, the title of the movie. Too Big to Fail, by the way, great HBO movie. Uh, the big conclusion of the 2008 financial crisis was the big problem is the banks are too big to fail. We have these banks that are too big to fail, and so therefore they're systemically, you know, risk, you know, in the, there's a financial crisis, they can take down the whole system, and so therefore they have to get bailed out. So the whole problem is we have these banks that are too big to fail. Right, and so they said, we need reform, we kept the R word, um, we need reform, and we, the reform is gonna be, we're gonna, we're gonna break up all these banks, we're gonna make them, you know, so you know, we break them up into many, many smaller banks, and so they're gonna be, um, uh, none of them will be too big to fail. So, uh, so Congress uh, passed something called Dodd-Frank in 2011, um, which was intended to address this. Um, I refer to this as the Big Bank Protection Act of 2011. Um, uh, the result of Dodd-Frank sitting here, you know, whatever, 12 years later is the too big to fail banks are much larger than they were before, right? The exact opposite thing happened. And in fact, JP Morgan Chase, which is the biggest of these banks, actually just bought First Republic. And so now it's even, it's even two or bigger uh, uh, to fail than it was before. Um, and, you know, Dodd-Frank was thousands of pages of regulatory requirements that in practice only a big bank can satisfy. Um, and so, and it turns out JP Morgan Chase has like 20,000 people in compliance. Um, and your new startup bank does not. Um, and so they can function in this system and your new startup bank can't. And then if, if you look at new bank charters issued in the US, they basically, after Dodd-Frank, they basically dropped to zero. Um, and so all the reforms that were marketed as we're gonna break up these banks so, they're, so that they're small enough we can let them fail generated the exact opposite result. And, and, and this is a very old story, right? This, 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 this is the exact same thing that's happened in the, in the national university system. It's the same thing that's happened in the healthcare system. It's the same thing that's happened in the, in the defense. All of the you know, procurement reforms that happened in the 70s and 80s in, in defense have all resulted in cementing a small group of very big companies into place. Are there examples we can look at where that tide was, you know, that, that, that momentum was changed to a different direction? So it, it has to be reformed. Um, so it, it, it has to be a direct, con and, and what happens is like, there's, you know, it's, there's always a question of like, who, whose interests are at play here, right? And so, and you, you get into all these things where like, okay, well, the big companies really love this, right? Because they, they want this level of protection. They want to have a sort of permanent cartel. You know, they, they would prefer a monopoly, but if they can't have that, they'll, t they'll take a cartel. Um, you know, the politicians like it because the, the big firms donate huge amounts of money to their campaigns, and by the way, they will hire them on the you know, on their, on, and, and their kids on their, on their way out the door. Um, and, you know, the media lo it loves it because these people are all big advertisers. And, and so, like, it, uh, the existing power structure just thinks that this is just, like, absolutely swell and fantastic. Yeah. The problem is you, you get ossification, you get stagnation, right? You get the, it, it's what happens whenever, whenever, there's, whenever there is not free market competition, you, whenever there's not market discipline, um, you get stagnation. And so, so, and this is where I said, it's like, there's, there's a big difference. Pro-business and pro-market, it turns out, are two totally different things. Um, pro-business translates into being pro-big business, which translates into being pro-regulatory capture pro-monopoly, pro-cartel. Pro-market means being pro-competition, right? And, and an actual competitive free market and actually new entrants. And, and by the way, the, the role of the new entrant in a market is not necessarily to win, although we like it when that happens. The other role that they play is they keep the big players honest, right? They, they, it's like, okay, they keep, they keep the big players on their toes because if there's actual competition, the big players actually have to get better because if they don't, they're, they're actually under threat. Yeah, I mean, you can use the, you know, if you're using the cartel example of the fangs, you can just use OpenAI and Google. I mean, the technology existed, and here comes somebody who smacks them. In the why don't you describe? Yeah. Why don't you describe? I, 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 yeah. Why don't you describe specifically what happened there? Because it's an interesting case. Yeah, I mean, the the this techno the T in GPT is a Google uh, technology, and uh, it's called the transformer. The transformer, yeah. yeah. And the uh, and this technology existed inside the company already, yeah. um, and it wasn't released because it wasn't perfect, and there's a bureaucracy and promotions and all of these other reasons. Yeah. I'm sure all good reasons. Yeah. But then, as OpenAI emerges, I mean, it's it's a wake up call. And then, you know, it's really important for Sundar to, <laughs> to really, like, take, as, as a product manager, to really take it on, on to himself to, uh, to rescue the company to some degree. Uh, but without the new player, we don't know any of this. Yeah. Generative AI is not happening right now. It would have been, it would have stayed locked up. And it would have stayed locked up, and that's bad for the economy. It's bad for us as citizens and as individual people. I talked talk to a, I talked to a senior leader out of Google a couple of days ago, and he's, he was on the he was in the management structure at the time this was all happening. So transformers were the core technology was invented in 2017, so you know six years ago. Uh, and I asked him if Google had had been going full speed um, after the invention of the transformer to get something like GPT-4 out, uh, when would we have had it? And he said four years ago. Yeah. Right. And so, and you know, this is tech. It's an immensely is, powerful company with yeah. incredible talent. Yeah. And by the way, like, look, the same story, actually, by the way, the same story happened. This is not a Google-specific story. Actually, I, the same story happened at IBM. Um, IBM invented the relational database. 
in the 1970s, and then Oracle actually is the company, right, that famously productized it. Yeah, I mean, didn't Larry Ellison read the paper, and yes. then, uh, yeah. Well, Oracle was the code, famously, Oracle was the code name of the CIA project that Larry Ellison was a software consultant on <laughs> to build a new database for the CIA. Um, and he found this IBM research paper from the mid-70s, and he's like, oh, that's the thing, and he built it, and the customer liked it, and he was like, oh, I should start a company. Um, and so, yeah, and then, and by the way, once Oracle shipped their own relational database, then IBM actually did bring their own to market in the form of DB2, and they've been, you know, fighting ever since. But so how do we do that in the defense market? I, again, I, I think it goes back to people People have to want it. Um, and, you know, there, there's obviously the, the customer here plays a very big role. But I look, I, like I said, I think the vendor I think the vendor plays at least a biggest role as the customer. It, 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 the answers are supply-driven, not demand-driven, uh, which is like, look, these products just have to be spectacular. Like, they have to be so good that they can't be ignored. Yeah, one of the surprises I think we've had at Applied is, um, whether it's in the automotive industry, in the defense industry, uh, to, to, to us, it's very obvious that these these industries need this kind of a, a technology, but we haven't seen many other. I mean, you have let me take defense. You have Anduril, you have Palantir, you have us, a handful of other smaller players, but you don't have this wave of defense tech like you will in generative AI or you will in I don't know uh, marketing automation, <laughs> like like almost any other subcategory. So you're a capital allocator. You care about national security. Uh, for the U.S., how do we get more founders to look at the market, and uh, what type, you know, what qualities do they possess, and how do we just get more defense-oriented or government-oriented uh, technology companies? Yeah, so look, unless there are really dramatic procurement reforms, I don't think you're going to see thousands of these companies. Right? So I don't think it's, it's because the, 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 the hill that people have to climb to become a successful vendor in this market is just, it's a much higher hill. Um, and so it's, it's a higher bar. It's, I don't know, it's like playing, a, playing a startup on hard mode, um, right? Like, it's, you know, it's not easy. Yeah, and it's, by the way, it's not random that all three companies I describe are multi-time founders yeah. who have a lot of experience who are playing in hard mode. Yeah, and are, and are willing to do what's required and are really willing to really put the time in and understand it and really, like, understand the mission and really get integrated in, into the culture and work the, work the bureaucracy and the processes and everything and staff in the right way. Um, and so there, there, there's not going to be thousands, but there, there, yeah, I mean, there will be more. Um, you know, any 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 help on the on the on the reform side would would, would accelerate that. But even, but even without that, there 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 will be more. You know, there, like I said, there won't be thousands there, but there there will be more. Um, and and look, part of it is I, I just think yeah, I just think that the technology is going to move so fast now that there are going to be entire categories. Uh, for I'll just give you an example for people who haven't seen it. Um, it's another one of not our company, so um, uh, I don't have uh, vested interest in this one, but it's, it's worth watching. So Palantir. Um, just uh, put up a video, a demo video on their YouTube uh, uh, channel, which is uh, they've they've incorporated this LLM uh, GPT technology into the front end of their whole um, sort of sensor battle planning kind of system that they have. Um, and so it's like a 10 minute demo video of like what it's going to be like to basically run super a, interesting run, worth watching run a yeah. battlefield and like and, and by the way and I don't even know like I don't even know if this specific demonstration is going to be the way that it's going to get rolled out but like if you just watch what happens in that video and what they do and what the new technology makes possible I think your reaction is going to be ooh like okay like what, whatever form this takes is going to be different um, and you know the companies that are going to provide this capability are probably going to be very different than the companies we're used to dealing with last question so uh, year uh, year ahead. Um, do you think it's just the year of generative AI, or uh, should other folks be looking at other other trends and, and, and things to, to read up on to better form themselves in their current roles or just uh, as a as a consumer? Well, there's also going to be so there's going to be a lot. So the so-called generative AI is kind of the hot, you know, legitimately the hot thing right now because of gen, so-called generating text and images and, and then videos. But look, the, the the fact that LLMs, large language models, work as well as they do, and this transformer technology works as well as it does, is the leading edge founders are now on the are, they're already on the what's next thing. And 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 the the two big categories that I'm hearing a lot about is one is perception. Um, and so I, the, the, the sense, at least, is there are going to be dramatic breakthroughs in perception, which is to say the ability for the machine to kind of map and understand the real world, you know, live. And so think, you know, think self-driving car, self-flying drone, but like, you know, m m continuously more advanced, uh, you know, breakthrough technologies. Um, and then, um, and then the other is in, con you know, so-called uh, planning and control, right? So uh, a, a new kind, new, new kinds of control systems. Um, and, and then, frankly, <laughs> this is where I get, I get maybe a little bit too excited. If you take uh, the language capability, so you know, the UI, you know, the ability to like talk to something and get answers back and engage with it in English, you add, you know, incredible, uh, uh, potentially a few more breakthroughs in perception, and then you add an incredible new control system. You basically have general-purpose robotics. 
Um, finally. Finally, finally. A again, after 80 years. And so e Elon, another thing just to watch is e Elon just did the Tesla um, uh, investor day yesterday and he demoed the latest. They're, they're actually, Tesla's actually building a humanoid robot. They're, they're building Westworld. Um, and it's one of these Elon things where when he first did it, you know, a lot of us were like, okay, that seems pretty out there. Um, but now it's like, okay, if you stack, like I said, if you stack language and perception and planning, all of a sudden it's like, okay. Like maybe we have the stack coming, um, and so I, I think I, I think that I, my my sense is there's a robotics breakthrough coming here that is going to be pretty profound, um, and it may it may come quite quickly, and so I think it's worth watching probably each of those three fields. Awesome, uh, amazing, and interesting as usual. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.